a newly described critically endangered frog that exhibits parental care and is found in the lost world. Oh, I'm blurry. Hey, today's video is going to focus on this awesome paper that I found called Bones and All, a critically endangered uh, pantopoi species, I might be mispronouncing that, of Stefania in a new osteological synapomorphy for the genus. Uh, so this is a paper I found a few weeks ago, wrote it down in my notes. Um, I've been trying to get videos out a little bit more often, but I have been... Uh, well, one, filming a lot of videos for a brand new course on biostatistics, and I just got back from a trip, so I'm kind of all over the place. But let's set the stage for where we're talking about. So this is Pantopoi. It is a region uh, in the uh, Pantopoi Forest and Shrublands ecoregion in the Guyana Highlands of northern South America. Now, this is a really cool and when, really cool region, and when I say it's a lost world, it is actually the area that inspired the novel the Lost World. Um, and you can just look at these pictures of this region. I mean, it is stunning what it looks like. I'm covering it up. I'm not the stunning one here. But this is an absolutely incredible region. And what's so unique about it, and so interesting about it, are these cliffs. It is considered, uh, if right here, more than, uh, more than 50 tabletop mountains forming an archipelago. I am covering up everything I need to show you. Uh, more than an archipelago of more than 50 tabletop mountains with isolated sandstone plateaus and summits atop nearly vertical escarpments. So this is really, really interesting. In biogeography, which is the study of how and where species are, this is a great example of a terrestrial island. Okay, let's break that down. So if we go into the whiteboard, uh, we're not doing a stats lesson, do not worry. We're not talking about homogeneity of variances. But if we have some biogeographic principle, let's think of the most famous example, which is Darwin's Islands, right? So we have an island here, maybe we have a smaller island over here, and then we have a really big island over here traditional biogeographic theory, uh, let's also draw one more island out here, um, tells us a couple different things. One is that species ranges uh, will be influenced by these islands, uh, particularly the way species are distributed and can move between islands. So what are some assumptions? Well, we assume, here let's write one, we assume that there are more taxa on larger islands, right? And that kind of makes sense. Um, there is more space and thus more resources. There is probably more heterogeneity of environments, meaning that there are more different microhabitats, different habitats in general on larger islands, okay? So if we wanted to draw a little graph of what this looks like, uh, where we have, let's say, size of island, and then we have uh, species richness, so I'll just put SP here, uh, we would assume that it would go up like this. As size increases, the number of species increases as well. But we also have another assumption, and that is that gene flow decreases we'll just draw a down arrow, with increasing distance. And this is kind of intuitive. Imagine you're a lizard on, uh, let's say, this island right here, this big island right here. Let's draw you in uh, red uh, or magenta or whatever this is. Let's say you're a lizard here. Well, what is it more likely? Is it more likely that you are going to end up going to this island via gene flow? Or is it more likely that you're going to go to this island way out here? Well, obviously there's an ocean in the way, presumably with many waves and many organisms that can consume you, the intrepid lizard. So it is way more likely that if you do move to another island, if you as an individual go somewhere else, it is more likely that it's going to be a closer island, okay? And this is, again, this is islands, okay? We assume this. But what if I told you this same principle applies to mountains 
Okay, so if we just move over, say this is Darwin's Islands. Awesome, cool, that's cool. Uh, but let's say we have some mountains, okay? We have a mountain range here. We have another smaller mountain range here. Maybe we have another one of those big flat top mountains like we're seeing in this paper. Well, will you look at that? We have very similar principles to this island rule. Here, we have larger area. Okay, we have different distances between the mountains because to an organism that is used to existing on this mountaintop, maybe above this elevation line, okay, for an organism to get to this mountain over here, assuming it can't fly, like it's not a bird, those weird things, um, it would have to go all the way down the mountain across different habitat and all the way back up another mountain okay that is very difficult for organisms for many organisms to do so you can actually apply the island biogeography principles that are used for islands to mountains and that is the setting for this paper now there is some stuff that is really cool here and I want to talk about the various different ways that this paper actually figured out, hey, this is a different species. It's totally different than the other ones. But I want to start with what actually attracted me to this paper to begin with. And that is the parental care in this uh, species. So as there, we're going to look at some very exciting stuff here. We're going to look at skull CT scans. We're going to look at phylogenetic materials. And we're going to look at some really pretty pictures of frogs. But one of the coolest things is this parental care here. So when I saw the headline for the article that I found this on, it was some Yahoo News thing, I assumed it would be very... I thought it would just be this uh, figure... What? Uh, what, what, figure, what number of figure is this? Figure 12C. The, they have some larvae and they're carrying it around. Uh, poison dart frogs are known to do this, as well as many other species of frog, where they will actually take their tadpoles and move them to more suitable uh, grounds for them to, uh, or I guess waters, for them to metamorphose into uh, adult frogs. But, but these frogs take it a step further because if you look very closely, I think there might be a, this is probably the best picture. Let's look. Why did it jump? I want to zoom. Okay, okay, I'm going to zoom. Oh, this is not the right way of doing things. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. See full size image. If we look, we see that these are not just tadpoles. These are actually small juvenile frogs. Look at that. These are metamorphosed. They are fully metamorphosed. They are no longer little polywogs. They are not tadpoles. They are actual froglets. And they are being carried around by, I believe it was a presumed, uh, yeah, females. So female parental care, matriarchal care. The mother is actually taking care of the young and keeping them safe. This is really fascinating. And I think it is way more widespread in uh, frogs, reptiles, amphibians in general uh, than we know because it is a fairly rare behavior. And we see something very similar to this in other organisms. Think about scorpions who carry massive amounts of their babies on their backs. Think about the amount of primates, the amount of mammals that carry around an offspring in order to keep it safe. Um, I don't believe there's a feeding component to these observations. They really don't know much. They've just observed multiple females carrying the young uh, at different life stages, we should add, so tadpoles up to froglets. Um, it seems likely that they actually metamorphose on the back of the mother. Uh, and we have other frog species, like the Suriname toad, which takes us to a whole other level. Uh, if you have trypophobia, look away. Um, but this is probably the most famous crazy f toad. Uh, we'll do the we'll do the we'll do the illustration because that's a little bit better. Also called the Pippa Pippa. Uh, I like Suriname toad. I just think it's cool. But uh, the eggs are embedded in the skin of the organism, and when they are fully metamorphosed, they uh, pop out of the back of the mother frog. So. This is what really attracted me to this paper. And I thought it was just going to be a behavioral paper of just, hey, we found a cool behavior. Uh, let me write up a note, put it out there for the world to see. Uh, if you ever see cool behaviors, write them up as a note. It's super easy, two or three pages long, no big deal, and it helps out science. Do it. It's cool. Great way to get started on your first publication. But this paper actually did a lot more 
than just say, these frogs carry around the babies on their back. So let's start breaking down everything they did. I'm not going to go too in-depth into the weeds on this, um, but this is the background of where they are found. Uh, the, the species that we're actually talking about, I haven't said it yet, we're only uh, 10 minutes into the video, is uh, Stefania McCulloughi. McCulloughi was actually named after, I believe, a Canadian herpetologist uh, who did a lot of work in, oh, excuse me, in Guyana. I generally don't like naming species after people. That's just my preference. Um, not for any grand reasons. I just think it should be based on characters, not people, but whatever. Uh, can't fault it. These are their authors. They describe the species. They can do kind of what they want. Um, but it is a very cool. So what are their methods? They did a lot of field work. Of course, they went out, they collected frogs, they found frogs, they measured frogs, they took genetic material from frogs, and, and they did CT scans. Now, CT scans are something that are coming up and becoming a, at this point, it is a standard tool in the herpetologist tool set. Um, CT scans are incredible. Just, just point blank, they are incredible. So if you want to see some of their results, uh, let's follow this link. Uh, ooh, I'm navigating away. Uh, so they took specimens of the frogs. Uh, this is the zoo bank. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. This is the publication reference. Um, sorry, I don't know why I got sort of confused. So uh, this picture is of a hollow type. This is the uh, specimen that you will compare all other specimens in the species to. Uh, so you take a lot of measurements. Uh, you take the dorsolateral view. This is the ventral view. This uh, specimen was euthanized. That is very common for museum work. Um, I know it's a bit of a controversial area to be euthanizing and collecting species that they themselves say are critically endangered. Um, I trust, I, I choose to trust that the authors made the choice uh, knowingly. Um, I've also worked in the museum, so I understand uh, really well. Uh, also, this is single author. I should give him credit. Uh, Felipe J.R. Koch uh, out at oh, faculty, ba, 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 London or Poland. One of the two. Uh, it's got two attributions, so Poland and uh, London. But anyways, uh, this is the type specimen, so if anyone needs to compare this species in the future, it will they will have a specimen to compare it to. Uh, museum records are very important. I will say that the nature of museums are changing dramatically in this modern era, uh, which is probably a topic for a whole other video. But uh, yeah, so they describe exactly why they named this species. Uh, they named it after McCulloch, uh, honoring Canadian herpetologist Ross Douglas McCulloch. Uh, he did a lot of work down there, particularly with this genus of frog. Again, he contributed to the field. Gray area for me. I wouldn't do it, but I'm not going to knock the authors for doing it. Um, and they just diagnose all the different characters of this species. If you've ever read a uh, herpetology field guide, this is what you are reading. Uh, a large species, max snout vent length in preserved females is 72.9 millimeters, 54.6 millimeters in preserved males. Uh, they have frontoparietal crest present, feebly developed, laterally projecting on the cranium. Uh, so this is just a very, very thorough description of this species, so that if someone else finds it in the future, they can describe it as well. And they can say, this is this species. Um, as well as some differences from uh, closely related species. So Stefania, I of course chose the worst one. Uh, let's just, uh, Stefania Riveroy. Um, <laughs> or also Stefania Ayungane. Ayungane. I'm going to say that's the way you pronounce it. Um, but this is a pretty standard way of doing things for uh, the, the, spe the species. So uh, description of the holotype. So this is a description of the individual specimen, not necessarily the whole species group, but just the individual specimen. Uh, so if there's any damage, if there are any uh, weird things that are popping off, they, they describe it here, as well as pictures. So you see here, this is a little tag. Uh, this is so they can actually identify the individual in the museum. So every single specimen is cataloged with a unique identifying number. Um, some organisms, I used to sort fish in a museum, and uh, we had one collection that came in where they had uh, put an individual tag on every individual fish, which sounds about right, but then you realize they have 200,000 mosquito fish, little gambusia, um, and they had tagged each one individually, when all we do is the jar is tagged, so you're like, 
this is uh, 500 specimens of Gambusia from this stream at this time collected by this person. Uh, and then that's a unique jar, so you don't have to tag 500 fish. You know they're all having the same metadata uh, of location, time, date, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, that's a total sidebar. Um, really good pictures of the feet. Feet are often how you identify different frog species. You look at these laterally expanded toes. They're bigger. This is a common thing in tree frogs. You look for the amount of webbing between the toes. Some have partial webbing. This one looks like it has no to minor webbing, maybe at these uh, base areas. But uh, yeah, uh, let's, let's, let's move on from the holotype because I think it's really cool, but we could talk forever. So what they did is they did osteology of the holotype. So this is a, a three-dimensional model of the individual specimen. And they did this with CT scans. So when I'm saying that this is such a cool methodology, I, I really do mean it. Because normally, normally, you would have to do a full uh, dissection of the species to actually get this data, to look at what is the skull morphology, what are the bones looking like. But instead, you can do CT scans which are non-destructive. You do not have to ruin the specimen in order to get this data. You could feasibly do it with live animals as well, and that's becoming more and more of a standard. So as we get more species with the CT scans, this is a really cool uh, example of something you can do. Skull morphology is a big, big usage of CT scans. And that's because you can attach markers. So that's what each of these are. Each of these is a marker on a specific bone or a specific feature of the skull. And you can take all of these features, do some fancy statistics, uh, probably principal component analysis, which you'll learn about in my biostatistics course that's coming out in a few weeks, maybe a week, who knows. Um, but you can actually test, hey, what is being affected? What is affecting the skull morphology of these species? Let's say you take an entire group. Let's say you take all of the Stefania species and you then take their skull morphologies. You get all of these markers and you say, well, I wonder if elevation affects their skull shape. I wonder if temperature affects their skull shape. I wonder if time of year, I wonder if sex of the individual, I wonder if any number of variables can actually affect skull morphology. That's what you can do with CT scans. Or with any other bone, you could do it with uh, you could do it with like a femur, you could do it with their toe bones, you could do it with so many different things. Skulls are just cool, and skulls are a pretty standard used one um, because there's wide variation in skull morphology. So it's really really interesting, and here they show a great example of how variable skulls can look between different groups. So you have. Um, S. McCulloughi up here. Uh, you see that the skull is maybe a, well, let's, let's zoom in just a bit. Uh, the skull is maybe a little bit uh, shorter. It has less vertical height than another species like this S. Coxi right here, which has this uh, protrusion on the top of the head. Um, so you can see very directly, even closely related species in the same genus, how they do have differences in skull morphology. They have unique features. They have differences in the width and the height. Um, and this is why you would use skull morphology. This might be a great way to actually identify different species in the lab. Say you have a bunch of museum specimens that are really tricky to ID, you could use the skull morphology to ID them out. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to gush over skull morphology because I do think it's, it's fascinating. Uh, the different ways you can use it, the amount of information you get just from CT scans of skulls is, is honestly pretty incredible. Um, they spend a long time talking about every single bone in the skull. We're not going to do that here because this would be a five hour video. Um, but uh, we should also note that it is a highly polychromatic species. Now we're adjusting, we're getting away from the skulls. Get your head out of the skulls, boy girl, you, person, what's up? Um, so uh, polychromatism, what, what, if we, what do we do? What do we break it down? Poly, many, chromatism, color. So this is a great reason why you cannot use color to identify species. Um, so these are the same species. These are all Stefania McCulloughi. Look at that. You have some that are kind of a drab brown, some with these beautiful patterns all the way up to this bright red individual. Um, if I read this correctly, it's not related to sex. So adult individuals range from plain brown, plain 
light gray brown medium brown with red wash to a chestnut brown with dark markings outlined by a cream color um, so many organisms many many frogs and toads can change their color as well um, I've personally seen toads on a property I work with a lot uh, Toucan Ridge where the toads have ranged from jet black to drab brown to a pale yellow to a deep deep red to almost green on the legs I mean it's 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 incredible how much variation there can be within a single species at a single site so uh, you can't use color to tell this species apart because there are many different colors um but they also looked at molecular divergence so this is that pairing what you want in my opinion if you are splitting up species i think you need two things you need morphological differences i i am not the biggest fan of species that are split due to uh, no morphological differences. You cannot tell morphological differences. Uh, there is a concept called cryptic speciation, which was found in this group. Um, generally speaking, cryptic speciation, it, it just means that species can be very difficult to tell apart, but they may be true and good species due to other criteria. Uh, they may have differences in sexual behavior they may not be able to actually mate properly uh, so one great example are the uh, the gray tree frog and the copes gray tree frog so they look very similar there is a slight difference in their call this this is uh these are two frog species found in the american southeast uh, and but they have different chromosome counts they actually have different numbers of chromosomes so if they tried to mate the offspring would be non-viable so they are true and good species but they look very similar um but what i'm saying is i typically think you need two things some morphological some um visible difference or i guess in the case of the tree frogs i'm talking about audible difference the calls may be different um but you also need that molecular difference um it's we, we we exist in the age where you can't just use morphology to tell species apart uh case in point here if you went out and this was a uh if this was a uh 1800s you know colonizer biologist coming out there they would look at each of these frogs and say oh hey these are all different species so we're not doing that anymore we use uh, genetic differentiation we look at molecular divergences between species and that's exactly what they did here so they looked at the genetic distances between two different groups um and so this one uh they they looked at ones that are um allopatric and sympatric meaning allopatric means they do not overlap in range and then ones that do overlap in range there's a uh, some theories uh principles maybe is a better word where if species are farther apart they are more distantly related you know the the frogs in america are more closely related to the frogs in central america the frogs in north america are more closely related to the frogs in central america than the frogs out in australia right that's like a extreme example but it can apply at almost all scales so uh, that's what they looked at here and they did find a decent amount of differentiation uh, between the different groups so there's enough to show that there are genetic distances um, admittedly admittedly only in the 16s ribosomal rna um, so you would need uh, possibly more dna to tell but they have good morphology differences. They have really thorough CT scans of skulls that show there are good and true morphological differences, uh, as well as this molecular divergence. Um, of course, more genes would be better, but not always required to actually say this is a good species. Uh, particularly when you realize that they are on these tops of these mountains, on the tops of these cliffs. Um, this is just more really cool habitat. I mean, these frogs are going in and out of these plants like crazy. Um, I want to say these are bromeliads, but I'm not a plant person. They look like bromeliads to me. I'm assuming they're bromeliads, but they may not be. So don't, uh, don't trust me there. Um, but yeah, I just thought that these frogs were absolutely crazy. Um, I actually, let me double check, make sure there's nothing else I really wanted to talk about. Um, again, uh, color, crazy, color, crazy color and pattern differences between species. Um these are these are actually three different species um is what it looks like so 
yeah, not the best example of what we were just talking about. But uh, yeah, th that, that actually really is it. Uh, so again, this was just a really cool paper that I wanted to show you, uh, primarily because of the, uh, the behavioral aspect of it. The, the fact that these frogs are carrying around their uh, offspring, showing uh, parental care, uh, particularly uh, matriarchal care, the mother taking care of the young. But also, it's just a cool paper that talks about really cool uh, new technology with CT scanning, or maybe not new technology, but old technology used in really cool ways, uh, as well as molecular divergence and just showing off a, a, a stunning, stunning region of the world. I mean, Jesus, pick your projects, guys. This is where you want to go study. Come on now. This is cool. So yeah, have a good day. I hope you like this. Uh, if you like what I'm doing, uh, give it a like, give it a subscribe. Uh, I'm not going to edit this down at all in any way. So this is 25, 26 minutes. If you watch to the end, you're cool as hell, dude. Uh, I hope you like this like uh, this, this like 25 minute ramble paper discussion. Um, yeah. Have a good day. Like, subscribe, do all those fun things. You're cool. Deuces.